I probably first met him in the 1980s, uh, speaking at a meeting that he was speaking at, so I didn't can't claim to have met him. And what impressed me all the way back then was how dedicated he was, how serious he was, I mean, just uh, how passionate he was. Uh, he was, and I thought, this is remarkable. Somebody who's uh, passionate, enthusiastic about what he's doing to improve the health of people at the coalface, literally, the miners and their families in, in South Wales and the valleys. So, uh, and then my contact with him over the years was desultory. I didn't meet him often, but it was somebody I kind of knew. And then I reviewed his book for The Lancet. And that was an experience. It felt like I'd been in his living room, um, talking to him, reading his book um, and reviewing it for The Lancet. And I said in my review, I've got a confession to make. I'm a Tudor Hart fan. So I thought I should confess to my bias. So anybody reading my review would know I'm a fan of Tudor Hart. And, um, and then I gave it a glowing review. And I think Graham Watt got in touch with me afterwards and said, um, Tudor Hart was so pleased with your review of his book. But I didn't do it to please him. I did it because I was just so impressed by this passionate man who's absolutely committed to the NHS and what it stood for and for doing the best by his patients. I wrote a piece for the BMJ um, on the 70th anniversary of the NHS about the inverse care law. And I had given the Tudor Hart lecture in Cardiff in, I think, November 2017. And Julian was ill, um, but he sat in the front row taking notes. Um, and then he wrote to me afterwards, engaged with it. And when I first heard about the inverse care law, I thought, given what I do, which is focus on the social determinants of health and inequalities in health. And given that we've got a national health service, that's not the main issue in Britain, that uh, lack of health care being the issue for health inequalities. And then having known about the inverse care law my whole adult life virtually, when I decided well, I was invited by the BMJ to write about Tudor Hart, I thought I'd better read the paper. <laughs> ah, that was an insight. So the paper is very clear. Message number one, the key determinants of health are the conditions in which people live and that the health of the people in South Wales are related to housing and nutrition and relative poverty and working conditions and or unemployment. So he's crystal clear about that. Um, second, he says, uh, in a way, the paper is, is an argument. The NHS solved much of the problems of inverse care. Those problems of the inverse care law less care for those who need it, is what comes from a market-based system. And he wrote in 1971, there are calls to return to a market-based system. Don't, because of the inverse care law, because the NHS solved the inverse care law, and that's not what we want to return to. And I should have read the paper when it came out instead of thinking I knew what it was about and it was irrelevant because when I read it, I thought, yeah, he's not saying that despite the NHS, we still don't have adequate care for those who need it. He's saying um, the NHS solved this major problem and don't go back to a market-based system. It's a pity that successive healthcare health secretaries, they're really health care secretaries, didn't listen to him. You know, the Lansley reform said, we want half of care to be in the market, to be delivered by private. I mean, who, 
this is ideology. Now, you might say Tudor Hart was ideological. Well, he was. But he was appealing to evidence that market-based systems lead to suboptimal distributions. And the third point in his paper, so the first is very important because that's germane to what I do, is the inequality in conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age that lead to inequalities in health. The second point is the NHS has been brilliant in making sure that maldistribution of health care doesn't increase those unfair inequalities in health, what I call inequities. The third is there are still inequities in care, particularly in relation to mental health. And he wrote to me after my Tudor Heart lecture in 2017, a long handwritten letter. I think he had trouble with his computer, um, a long handwritten letter. And he died not so long afterwards, but he said, there's some call to reduce the number of GPs. And you could do that if you lived in Beaconsfield rather than Glen Corrie. Um, you know, if you lived in an affluent area, uh, you could do that if you didn't want GPs to get involved in public health. And you could do that if you assumed that the brain was not part of the anatomy of patients. So in other words, don't do it because more deprived areas need GPs because GPs should be getting involved in public health. And that's part of an argument I've been having more recently, how can we get the health care system to address social determinants of health? And the third is consider the mental health of patients uh, and GPs need to do that. And then when you consider the mental health of patients, when you look at the social gradient, the lower down you are, the more deprived the area in which you live, the greater the mental health problems as well as physical health. And Tudor Hart rightly saw primary care practitioners, GPs, as being central in managing the mental health problems of patients. I had a very interesting experience in New Zealand and it would not be terribly different in this country. I was invited by the New Zealand Medical Association a few years ago, and they were terrific. Uh, not, not just that they were graceful and gracious hosts, and they were, um, but they were actively engaged in what I was talking about, actively engaged. How can we work with the conditions in which our patients live uh, and improve the conditions? So it was brilliant. And then at one point, one of them made some off-the-cuff disparaging remark about public health. And I thought it was really interesting. They didn't see me. I'm a professor of epidemiology and public health. They didn't see me as public health. They didn't see what we were talking about together. We'd spent three days together. You know, I was in meetings with them morning, noon, and the evening. Um, and they didn't see it as public health. They saw public health of these boring guys who do something about something or other, but it's not what we're talking about. And I've had similar reactions from G GPs. Yeah, yeah, we're very concerned with the conditions in which our patient li patients live. Just don't confuse us with public health. Well, Julian had no problem with that. That wasn't, he wasn't going to get involved in those disputes. He knew GPs, qua GPs, had to be involved in the health of the populations that they serve. And that's his language, um, they, that they work together with the communities that they serve. And that's part of public health. So, yeah, I understand. But, you know, I was, I gave a lecture to the Royal College of GPs, one of the named lectures, I have to add a year to everything because of lockdown, so I can't quite remember if it was, <laughs> it wasn't last year, but it was the year before or the year before that. And 
it was very clear. The attendees at that conference, all GPs, and the leadership of the college, all GPs, were a natural audience for my message and natural allies uh, for what I'm trying to achieve. So precisely because GPs understand, I mean, if they um, have all their considerable capacities working, they understand very well how the conditions of their patients' lives impact on their health. Um, And perhaps at some points, they might have said, well, that's not my job. My job is to treat their diabetes or hypertension or whatever it is. Perhaps more, some GPs are saying, no, my job is to look at the conditions that give rise to the hypertension or the diabetes um, and make life difficult and to see what we can do. And much of that is not just being sensitive to patients' condition, but working in partnership, saying it's not what I, the frontline doctor, can do by myself, but what I can do in partnership with others.